a number of years ago, I had a, a gift, I considered it a gift, that it was right before Rosh Hashanah, it was in the middle of Elul, and the chauffeur's blowing all over the place, and suddenly I got a notice from a, uh, a court, an upstate court, something I had forgotten about a long time ago, uh, a traffic ticket. I got them pulled over, pulled over someplace upstate, but they didn't forget. And they sent me a notice, and suddenly I have to appear in court. Oh my gosh, OMG, as we say. Eh? What's going to be? And I was, I, I was, I was shaking inside. You know, are they going to revoke my license? Are they going to hit me with a many hundred dollar fine? And then after I went through the process and I appeared before the judge, and he wasn't too harsh with me, and he slammed the gavel down a few times and he asked me a few pointed questions. It was a few hundred points, of, I mean, a few hundred dollars. And, if, and a point or two would, it didn't damage my, uh, my, my rating for the, for, for the insurance so much. But then I realized what an opportunity I had that I was being called at the court a few weeks before Rosh Hashanah. And it reminded me that here we are, and I'm about to enter into a bigger court where there's more things than just a few points on the license and a few hundred dollars that are at stake. Our Chazal Tellers, Gemara and Beya says that kol parnasasa shel adum Katsuvim me Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, that the whole livelihood of a person, people running to work, they're running to 47th Street, they're going out into the world, we're hustling, we're bustling. Benafsho Yavi Lachmo, with the person's effort, he gives up his life in order to make a livelihood, and yet it's all determined between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, Hina Yom Hadin, this big determination, not just a few hundred dollars, millions and millions of dollars, whatever, whatever can be granted to the person. And also, who's going to live and who's going to die this year? It's going to be scripted into the, in, into the year. They say with a famous old story that uh, one of the great Bali Musar stood up before his congregation and he said over this following thing, Rechaim Shmulevis, he said that one of his, one of his the Balabatim in that past year had, had caught a cold and he, and he passed away. He said, well, you know, what happened to Chaim? He says, Chaim, oh, he went out without a, without a coat, and he went out without the proper shoes, and he stepped in a puddle, and he caught a cold, and the cold turned into a pneumonia, and the pneumonia turned into something else, and high fever, and then he passed away. And he says, that's what happened. He says, no, that's not what happened. He said, he caught a cold during Musaf, right? That's when he chilled out. His neshama chilled out. He, he decided, he, he sp- when, when, the life, when the year was being scripted and everything was being written over there, so that's when he spaced out. That's when he chilled out. That's when he caught his cold, so to speak. So everything is being scripted on Rosh Hashanah. So it's a very, very frightening day. Who's going to live? Who's going to die? We say in the Sana Tokif. Rosh Hashanah. And as the rabbi said, we're celebrating. Right? How can we possibly celebrate on that day? But I have a couple of other questions, important questions, and I'm going to line them up. And then I'm going to try to unravel them. And then hopefully I won't leave the room until we've unraveled and, and, and explained all the, the, all the questions and the dynamics of what's happening in the next few weeks with each and every one of us. So one question is, it's not my own question. I saw the Orga de Yahu asked the following question. How can a person possibly stand? It's Hine Yom HaDin. The world was created originally with Din. We're going back to that original position that the world was when things started out. And Din, Kodesh Baruch decided, I can't run the world according to Din. I have to insert and include something called Rachamim, some allowance for error. Din is a standard that there's no allowance for any error. The piano player is playing, suddenly hits one clunker note, bah, 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 you know, all of a sudden the trap door opens up, he's gone. You're one day late with the mortgage payment and suddenly they repossess. That's it, it's too late, it's, it, it's finished. There's no allowance, no tolerance for any error. There's no negotiations, it's finished, it's over. It's over. So who can live and who can exist in the light of that din? Hine yom ha din. That's what it means. Din means it's a standard of din. Not that there's a judgment taking place, but there's a standard called din. That's one question. Who can live up to that light in, 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 the, in, the, in the examining, in the precision of that examining light? Who, which one of us is so perfect that we don't have a wrinkle or some, 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 something wrong that, that we can say, oh, I feel confident, I can be happy in that day going into yom ha din. We'll have, come up with an answer, Bez Hashem. And plus, on top of that, here we're starting the 10 days of tshuva, and we go through the whole Rosh Hashanah Maksur. If I was going to a court case, I would talk to my lawyer, what do I have to prepare? So who's our lawyer? Our lawyer is the chazal. They tell us what to, what to, how to speak, how to position ourselves. Everything is included in the machzor, right? So we look at the machzor, and what is the machzor advising us? We go through the whole machzor. It doesn't say one time 
that we said anything, that we did anything wrong. How about that? That's one time. Here's the first two days of the ten days of tshuva, and we don't say anywhere that we did anything wrong. It's a little, it's a little bit strange. The one time when we do mention that we did a chait in Avinu Makenu, we say Avinu Makenu Chatanu Lefanecha, but our lawyers there holding on to our army says, "Don't give a clap, don't don't admit to anything, plead the fifth, because everybody makes mistakes. It's a generic statement that we all make mistakes, but don't admit that you did anything wrong. So there's no." discussion about anybody having ever done anything wrong. So we're starting off the year, no discussion about anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. So how do we do tshuva if we didn't do anything wrong? And what's the determination being made on? Who's going to live? Who's going to die? Based on what? It's a little confusing. I'm coming to the court and I don't even know what I'm being accused of. And I don't even know how to defend myself against what I'm being accused of. So what's going on with this day? So the Chazal tells us what? That there's three books that are opened up. I have to understand this in a way that doesn't sound like it's a comic book. But there's three books opened up, right? One is a book for tzaddikim, another is a book for benonim, for in-between people, and there's another book for rishayim, for wicked people. And the Chazal tell us <coughs> that the righteous people are immediately written into the book of life. The rishayim, the wicked people, are immediately written into the book of death. And the benonim, the in-betweeners, the Chazal, the, the Talmud uses such a statement like this. They say, toilim ve'omdim, hanging and standing ad Yom Kippur until Yom Kippur comes along. What is this, hanging and standing? What kind, of, what kind of thing is that? Hanging, are you hanging or are you standing? When I was a little kid, right, Mrs. Frankel will tell us, yeah, I, used to, I used to climb out of the crib. I would not remain in a crib. Every night my mother kept hold me and, and I'm hanging on, right? So what is a person either hanging or you're standing. You can't be hanging and standing at the same time. Either hanging there, right, or you're standing. But you can't be hanging and standing. If you don't hit the ground, you're hanging. If you're standing, you're on the ground. What is hanging and standing? Ad Yom Kippur. And then we have to examine the statement that the tzaddikim immediately written into the book of life. What does that mean? Right? When my wife and I were married 28 years ago that year, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zecher Tzadok Levracha, he passed away. Right? So that means that that year he was written into the book of death. <clears throat> He's a tzaddik. Everybody in the Kuliyama lo pligi. Nobody disagrees. I think that year, that year also the stipler, Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky, also passed away. Everybody agrees. He was a tzaddik. So what do you mean? That Rosh Hashanah was scripted in that somehow he should be written into the book of death? It didn't happen. How could that be? It doesn't make sense to us. Is this, is, is this some, some kind of a, a game that the Chazal is telling us? We go back and we say, we realize also that there's people that everybody would agree that are Rishoyim. For example, Hitler, Yemach Shemal. 1939, 1940, 1941, 1942, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, Kolboy Olam, all the creatures of the world, not just Jews, are being the things are being determined on Rosh Hashanah. How did he survive those years? Shouldn't it have been that he was written into the book of death during those years, and yet, you know, he continued to live, and he got stronger, and he got more powerful. How can such a thing happen? So, so, so sometimes we lose faith in these statements when they don't match up with our picture and our experience of what's going on in reality. But we want to give some texture and some explanation. And maybe two other questions, then we're going to go unravel some answers. I'll remind you the questions as we, as we get to them. And in Rosh Hashanah, so we have Rosh Hashanah, then Yom Kippur. Why should we have a day of judgment first? And then Yom Kippur, Slicha, the Kippur, forgiveness and atonement. Seems like it would make a lot more sense to do it another way around, right? If I was, with Kodesh Baruch referred to Harachaman, the merciful one, if I was designing it, let's do Slicha Vakapora first, I'm coming into the court, and then we'll have Yom Adin, right? So first we'll have a, uh, a chance to clean ourselves up, Slicha Vakapora, boom, 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 yeah. And then Yom Adin, and when I'm looking good, and I'm cleaned, and I'm polished, you want to present the diamond? You know, you got to polish it and work it over. And then present and say, now, now what do you think of it? Don't present it when it's rough and it's raw, and then later on only polish it up and, 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 and put it into the showcase. First, polish it up. So I would design Yom Kippur first. I was doing it, okay, slicha. And then I would do Rosh Hashanah afterwards and have Yom Adin, the great determination of, of, of what the year is going to look like. Huh? Sounds a little bit better. And not only that, I would back the whole thing up 10 days. Here we come into the first day. We're starting a new year. And we step into brand new, uncharted territory, a, a, a blank book. And we're onto that beautiful new piece of paper, Mana Nir Zeh. How beautiful is this piece of paper? How beautiful is this field? A beautiful, unplowed field, plowed field, with, filled with potential. And we're about to step onto it. And the first thing is, din. 
Imagine a kid shows up for the first day of school, <coughs> and he arrives, and the teacher's taking attendance. Uh, 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 Lamb, aren't you the kid who broke the mirror in the bathroom last year? <coughs> aren't you the one who wrote his name, you know, uh, with a permanent marker on the uh, uh, on the wall over there? Are you? Uh, uh, we paid for it, and I and I and I. And I wrote a hundred times on the blackboard, I will not, you know, desecrate school property. And I, and my parents came down, and we, you know, and I did, and, and I, <laughs> what are you attacking me in the first day of school? Huh? Finish it up before the first day of school, right? Back it up. Have Yom Kippur 11 days before. Have Yom Adin on the last day of the year. And then Rosh Hashanah, walk in, relaxed and comfortable, like you're coming into a brand new school with your number two sharpened pencils, everything's very nice. You know, what, what do we have to schlep last year's business into the new year? Right? It seems, it seems like a much more merciful system. So let's try to unravel some of these questions. I'm not expecting anybody to remember them in order. So I'm not going to tax your minds. Everybody wants to relax and have a good time. But let's enjoy a, a brief story. I think that will help us understand why the order of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur comes the way that it does. And this is a story I heard many years ago from Rabbi Uziel Malevsky Zatzal, who was a Rav in, uh, in Mexico City. Uh, and I, he used to work for Osemech, and I, I knew him fairly well. And he told over the following story. It was amazing. That there was a shepherd boy, and he happened to be on the King's Highway. Not in Brooklyn, King's Highway, but he was on the King's Highway. And he was sitting, and he was minding his own business, and he was playing his flute, and he was taking care of his flock of sheep. When along comes the king with his giant motorcade and entourage following behind him. You can imagine stretch limos, you know, going all the way back. And this boy is sitting there on the highway. He parked himself there. So when they see him sitting there, and he's blocking traffic, and he's pro blocking the progress of the king, so right away, they start to honk on the horn. Okay? So if that sounds familiar, please let me know. Okay? And it, they're hopping away. And this guy's waving his hand. He's kind of stop making so much noise over here. Leave me alone. You know? He's sitting playing his flute minding his own business, and they're trying to, you know, push him off the, but he's, you know, waving his hand at the king in a very dismissive way, very, very insolent, rude. And the people, the, the king's men, they said, you know, let's incinerate him. Let's just run him over. Let's just get him off the highway. You know, how dare he stop the king? How dare he act like that to the king? The king says, I have, a, I have another plan. You know what we'll do? Invite him. See if he wants to take a ride with me in my limousine. They said, what? A ride? You're going to invite him in even closer? He says, yes. I want, to take, I want to invite him in for a ride. They invite the shepherd boy. He says, yeah, looks like a nice machine you got there. Sure, I'll come in for a ride. He sits in the back seat, and he's sitting right next to the king. There's the king with his royal robes, his beard, his crown. And the shepherd boy, muddy, with his, with his sandalim, sits down next to him over there. And he looks up at this fellow. He goes, oh, wow. He says, nice beard. <clears throat> is it real? He gives a tug on the king's beard. Very, very, the people, the, the driver looking in the rearview mirror said, you know, I could just press the ejection button and I'll send him into another universe. Let's get him out of here. No, 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 the king says, patience, patience. And he starts, he says, oh, those royal robes, let me try that on. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, does that fit me? It's a little big. He's, he's, he's talking to the king. He's saying all these different things. The car is going. And he's saying terrible jokes and using inappropriate language. And he's making comments that, you know, that, that, that the people around the king who know the honor of the king are just very embarrassed about. They, 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 they just, how, how can the king put up with this? And they small, come into a small town. When they arrive in this small town and they're driving through slowly, they slow down. Suddenly they start to hear that there's people saying, the king, the king, welcome the king. And they're waving placards. And they're holding up signs and they're yelling, the king, the king, the king. And there's all kinds of trumpets blowing and everything. And they're slowing down and they open up the windows so people get like a little peek, a little visage into the car. And the king is looking out and waving and the people are trying to get a peek at the king and they're all clamoring. And the boy says, slow down, slow down, there's a the middle of a parade over here. I want to see what's going on in, the, in, in this parade. And the king says, and, and, and they keep on going slowly through until they exit the town. It's a small little town, a, little, a, sm a small little village. And the fellas, the boys, oh, come on, it was a parade. We should have stopped over there. I want to get out. I wanted to see the king that everybody was talking about. He doesn't realize he's sitting next to the king. So they go and they continue on the road. They come to a slightly larger town. Okay? They went from upstate New York. Now they're in Muncie, OK? <laughs> and next thing you know, ooh, there's, now there's, there's a few thousand people out there. And they're yelling, the king, the king, the king. They slow down. They're going down Main Street. And everybody's out there waving their placards. They're blowing. And they're, they're, they're cheering. And they're accepting and they're honoring the king. 
And the boy says, slow down, slow down. Maybe we'll get out. We'll take a look. We'll wait for the king to pass. They're all looking for the king. Meanwhile, they're peering at the car. He doesn't realize that they're looking. They're trying to get a look inside where he's sitting right next to the king. Now they come to the big city. They come to, come to Queens. Okay. <clears throat> that is tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. New York. All the boroughs, they all come into one place and they all start to scream, the king, the king, the king. And as they slow down and the ticker tape is flowing all over the place and people are screaming, he sees the tens and tens and hundreds of thousands of people yelling, the king. Suddenly, he starts to, something starts to dawn on him. He realizes, hey, wait a second, this is the third parade that we've confronted today. And the people are all staring in this general direction. There's no other cars in the motorcade except us. And they're all, and this guy looks pretty regal the one that's sitting next to me. And suddenly he gets the shock of his life playing backwards and realizing all the things that he said that he shouldn't have said if he was, this is actually the king. And suddenly he falls down at the king's feet because it dawns on him in one moment. He grabs the king's feet and he says, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean you're the king, you're the king. You could have sent me. I oh, the king. Now he's worried. He's in front of the king. And the king says, Salachti kedivarecha. I forgive you as we had spoken. So now with that, we can understand why we say have Rosh Hashanah first, and the last of the questions that we asked, and then Yom Kippur second. Why Rosh Hashanah first? Because we can't have Yom Kippur until we have first Rosh Hashanah, right? It's, it, it, it's impossible. Until we spend two days pumping up and realizing HaMelech, that's the real single word that we focus in on Rosh Hashanah. It's a coronation for Kodesh Baruch Hu. In front of the Chobos Lubav says, don't look at the size of the chait. Look at the, in, the size of the one in front of whom the chait was committed. Who was the size of that one? So when we realize that it was done in front of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, then all of a sudden the person comes to a recognition and they say, Slach, Salachdi, forgive me, forgive me. Kodesh Baruch Hu, Salachdi, Kedavrech, I forgive you as you had spoken. So that's why we say in the David, Hashem Uri, the Chazal tells us, which is Rosh Hashanah, the lights go on, and then... Hashem Yishi, Hashem is my one who forgives me, Zay Yom Kippur. First has to come a recognition of that there's a king, and that there's a boss, and that there's a that there's Hamela, that there's a Yud Kevavke in the world, and we're living in the world of Yud Kevavke, and then only after that, now we come to a recognition that then we better clean ourselves up. That's why we have first Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur. And now what is the judgment being made upon? What is the judgment? What is the great determination? Me, Yechev, me, Yamus, all these different things. Let's understand just a few dynamics of the shofar. Again, I, I'm, I'm trying, I want to explain, I want everybody to be as prepared as we possibly can. I want to prepare myself also. I'm going to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. <clears throat> what is the determination? I have to remind myself. What is the determination being made on? And it's interesting that when we read one of the readings that we do on Rosh Hashanah, is about Yishmoel. And Yishmoel was going to do terrible things to the Jewish people in the future. Ad Hayom Azeh, there's actually, a, the, the, the Chaim Vital says there's actually a fifth Golis, right? Not just four Galut, but there's a fifth one. And it has to do, it's going to be more cruel than all the other ones, and it has to do with the Golis of Yishmoel. There's some very frightening, frightening things he records, Reb Chaim Vital. So, so, but Yishmoel cried, and we read about he, he was cast away from Abraham house, and it says, V'sham Elohim is kol hanar, Kodesh Baruch heard the voice of the, of the boy, Ba'asher Husham, as he was there. Of course, Rashi picks up, what do you mean, as he was there? Everybody's got to be someplace. You know, you don't have to say, as he was there. Everybody is where they are. And it says, as he was there, but not as he's going to be in the future. Which means, if he was broken, if he was humbled, if he was uh, nullified in that moment over there, he was sincere for that moment, that's all that counts. We're not going to look at the future. So we learn from that over there that one of the things about Rosh Hashanah is that we're not being judged on the future. Nobody's making a pledge of the future. What I promise to do, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You know, it's not, it's not a day for like uh, New Year's Day when people make resolutions. I'm going to lose weight this year. Oh, this year, you know, this year, you know, I'm going to do this. It's not, it's a, as a matter of fact, there's a famous vort from the Kutzke Rebbe. He says, Ede Hashem Ba'aretz, Hashem's eyes are in the land. Mirashis Hashanah, from the beginning of the year, Ad Achri Shana, until the end of year. It starts at Hashanah, the year, and it ends up year. Because every year starts at Hashanah. This is going to be the year, and it ends up sometimes being year, just another year. So, the, so sometimes these pledges, we don't even come through with them. Right? I'm just saying it doesn't mean you can't have dreams and, and plans we'll get to in a second. And also, another thing is, another quality of the chauffeur, 
just to understand how it works, is that the shofar has this ability, the Talmud says, to do something called ma'arvev the satan, confuses the satan. The satan, suddenly, the policeman pulls you over, he says, license and registration, please. He takes your card. He goes back to his computer now. All the police cars are equipped with, with computers. Calc- t- 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 boom, and he plugs it in. Suddenly, computer's down. I can't access the, the, the network. Can't find anything about the past. I don't know whether you have points in your license, whether you don't have points, whether you have a good driving history or a bad driving history. There's nothing in the past. So I just have to come back and take a look at the person as he is in the present. The, 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 so there's no, there's, no, there's no mention of the past. So the good news is... What we're being judged on has nothing to do on Rosh Hashanah with the past. And it has nothing to do with the future. Which brings up a very, very important question. That's not just a philosophical question. What is the person standing there on Rosh Hashanah, stripped of the resume of the past, and naked from any promises and ambitions for the future? What is the person? When someone goes out on Shaduch, right, they want to know right away, you know, what's his history? What, was he, you know, what has he been doing till now? And then what are his plans? What is he going to be doing? And he's applying to this school, and he's now taking a course and getting certification in this. We want to know who's the person based upon the motion of their life, where they're coming from, and where they're going to. But if you take that away from a person, you want to know who are you without that, what is the person? It's a very, very important question, because that's the, that's the point on which all the determination is being made. Who is this person without the past, interrupted from the past, and without the future? What is a person? So beautifully, we have an answer from Miktav Meliahu, from Rabbi Eliyahu Eliezer Dessler, and he says the following thing. He says, Mahuso shall Adam, that the essence of a person, ze ritzono. This is the ratzon of the person. Ratzon means the desire. What, is the, the, what does the person want? That's the essence of a person. In the present moment, what is, you want to know what is a person is in the, deep in the heart, deep in the core of that person. What is that, what is that cold mamadaka, that, that small sliver, that small thin voice that's inside everybody? What is it? That's the rutzon. Usruas melech bo, that's the rutzon of the person that's deep inside. That's what the chauffeur is digging for, that the chauffeur is, is resonating in the person. That's the desire of the person to come close to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, Kirvas Elohim Litov. That's the desire of the person. And Bar Hashem that that's what we're being judged on. Because, another beautiful statement that the Orgad Eliyahu explains this amazing statement. The amazing statement is that the reason why we're being judged at that moment like that, and this will help us understand one of the first questions we asked, how can a person be held to the standard of din, to the standard of judgment, which is an infinitely high, intolerant standard? And, it, and it's because of the following thing. Because there's a statement, a sagely statement that says, Ein dover omid bifnei haratzon. If that's the essence of the person, is the rutzon, the desire of the person, then an ain dover nothing stands in front of the will. The only question is, what does it mean nothing stands in front of the will? When I first saw that statement, I was a little bit put off because it sounds like a rah-rah statement, something that a sales coach is going to tell his team, and 80% are going to do 20% better, or 20% are going to do 80% better. But in order for it to be a true statement, it has to be 100%. It has to be batting 1,000. It can't be you know, just something that gets you all charged up and to do a little, try to do a little bit better, and we all become a little improved from it. It has to be a statement that's absolutely true. So the Or Gedal Yahu, Reb Gedal Yahu Shor, Zecher Sadat Levracha, my Rebbe's father, had written the following thing amazingly. He says that, how does it mean, what does it mean, ain't of her omid with Neharatzum? He explains like this very practically that in the world of action, in the world of misa and of doing, we all have limitations, right? Someone comes to me and they, you know, uh, show me one of those uh, laminated sheets, you know, that tells a sad story about what their financial condition is. And I'm touched by the story. So touched that I reach in my pocket and I take out a, my uh, checkbook and I start to write. My wife is usually standing behind the fellow and giving some kind of a hand signal, right? And, she, and, and I start to write a one, and then I put a, a zero. Now let me ask you a question. Is there any limit to how many zeros I could put before I get to the decimal point? Is there a limit? No. Thank you, Moshe. I appreciate that. You know? <laughs> is it, I could put as many zeros as I... What if I put one more zero than I have in the bank, you know? Let's say I put what, the one, I put $100,000 worth there. But, I, but all I have is nine, $90,000 in the bank, let's say. 
then what have I done? I've sent out a bad check, right? I, maybe I committed a, a, a federal crime, you know, some kind of fraud or something like that. I, 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 the fellow's going to go out and, and, and solve all those problems, but he's going to find that the check bounced, and I didn't do anybody a favor. I'm going to get a, a big charge for it. So I didn't do anything. So there's a limit. There is a practical limit to how many zeros I could put. And the limit is what I have in my bank account, how deep my pockets are, how short my arms are to reach into those deep pockets, even if my pockets were deep. So everybody has limitations on what they can do. But then sometimes you give the person a little something or other. You say, here, this is for you. And then when, he, when he's ready to leave, you shake his hand and you tell him, I hope that everybody, and I wish that everyone should give you, and th- you know, people can be generous in words, thanks a million, right? You've heard the expression, right? People can be generous in the world of speech. But there's a limitation in my power of speech also because there's only so much I can, my language is limited and my power of empathy is limited and there's only so much you can say to a person to try to appease them. Now here comes the crunch time. Is there any limit to how much I can want to put, how many zeros I can want to put before I hit the decimal point? Right? And the answer is over there, no. And that's really the practical point over here is that there's no limit even though in the world of action I'm a limited person in the world of speech. I have my limited vocabulary and sense of feeling and connectivity with another person. But in the world of wanting, there's no limit to how much I can want to help, right? That means that I can put an infinite amount of zeros. Uh, That's what the chauffeur is pushing over there. Climb up the ladder. There's no limit. There's no limit to the height of that ladder. Climb as high as you want. In the world of Machshava, Ein Dover Omid Bifneha Ratz, nothing stands in front of the will means that there's nothing that stops the person from wanting. We're being judged in an unlimited way. In the world of wanting, there's no difference between me and the Benish Chai, between any one of us and the Chofetz Chaim, between anybody over here and Avram Avinu and, and, and Yitzchak and Sari Menu and any of the great person that have ever walked on the planet. There's no difference between, between them and any of us. Because they wanted to be Mamluk, they wanted to crown a Kodesh Baruch Hu over the whole world. They wanted that. And they were able to do more. Because their hands were better trained. And their hearts were better activated. And their minds were stronger. But we could want the same thing that they want. We just can't carry it out the way that they were able to carry it out. And therefore, a person can stand in Yom Adin and can actually be held to that standard because in the area that we're being judged, it's in an area of unlimitedness, of, of, of limitlessness. The only, the only limit is the limits that we put on ourselves. Right? They say there was a fellow, he went, he was in the zoo. He went with his son. They were going around to different uh, stations in the zoo. There's the walruses and here's the monkeys. And finally he steps out into the area, large animals. There's the elephant right there. Oh my gosh, uh, an elephant, a many, many ton elephant, big like this room, standing right there. And the fellow's there, and he goes, oh my gosh, the elephant's right here in the open. He's not even contained in anything. He was shocked, he was scared. In front of the elephant was one of those little link chains, you know, like they put in front of the grass. So you just, nobody casually walks across the grass in front of the shul, right? And the, ch- and the elephant had around his neck like a kite string that was stuck into one of those little green sticks that's in the ground that you ho- use to hold up a tomato plant. And that's all that's holding the element, elephant from charging forward and stepping, stepping and trampling in a few steps. This fellow and his son, he calls to the guard. He says, the elephant is out of his cage. He's going to trample us. We're all in danger. And the guard says, don't worry about it. He says, what do you mean don't worry about it? He says, the elephant, he's, he, 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 he's right over here. And he, he, he can step forward. He says, don't worry about it. The elephant ain't going nowhere. He said, how do you know the elephant's not going anywhere? He says, because we had Dumbo here in our little, he was born into captivity right here in our, in our zoo. And from the earliest six months of his life, we had a big, heavy chain around his neck that was anchored into a concrete uh, piece that was stuck deep into the ground. It was unmovable. And we put an electrified fence in front of him that every time he took a step forward, <laughs> He got an electric shock. Then when he got big, we took away the concrete blocks. We took away the big chains. And we just put a little string around his neck to remind him. And we put a little stick into the ground as a remnant of what it was like 
when he was when he was a little boy. And now we don't even have to put a shock there. We just put the little little link chain over there. He's afraid to move forward, right? Even though he can do it, but he's afraid to do it. And therefore, on Rosh Hashanah, the beauty on Rosh Hashanah is that we're getting a chance to stretch ourselves out. What would you do if you had all the resources in the world, right? Who would you be if you didn't know who you were until now? How old would you be if you didn't know how old you are, right? What would you do for the world? What would you do for Hashem's world? What would you do for Hashem if you had unlimited powers and resources and communication skills? You could speak to the world. What would you say? Right? We would do the same thing that Avram Avinu wanted to do. We would do the same thing that Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to do. I, we wake up in the morning ourselves with our limited capacities and our limited ability to express ourselves and to understand what's going on in the world. But on Rosh Hashanah, Kodesh Baruch says, take off the ceiling. There was a yeshiva that was one time asked, what would you do if you had unlimited resources? Somebody came, a consultant came to ask him the following question. And they were thinking, what would you do if we could pay our teachers, right? And that's what they were thinking, you know? Who, 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 who thinks like that? Because they never thought beyond a certain limit. They're only thinking, you know, we have to borrow from this one to pay back that one in order to match our budget, in order to keep the teachers even somewhat happy. But to think about what would you do in an unlimited world to take off the ceiling. And Rosh Hashanah is telling, is, is opening us up to the opportunities, a stretch. If we would have just had Yom Kippur first in Rosh Hashanah, then we would have said, what do you want to be this year? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want? What, what, what's going to come from this person? Do you say, well, how many books you want to read? How many books did I read last year? Two? I read another two. Okay. How much Torah are you going to learn? I learned a little bit of Torah. I learned, I learned a little bit of Torah also. But since in Rosh Hashanah it says, take off the ceiling, then I want to learn the whole Torah. I want to fulfill all the mitzvahs. I want to bring all the Jews back to Israel. I want to bring the whole world together. I want to create peace. I want everybody to be aware of Kodesh Baruch Hu. I want to clean away all the Avodah Zarah and all the Shtus and all the Narashkite and all the Shtuyot from the world. I want to have a Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim with those Jewish people that we all come together. Keep us gullious. I want all those good things for Hashem and for the world. Hashem's original plan, Avram's original plan. <clears throat> That's what I want for the world. Let me stretch up and see what I can do. Even if practically I can't do it. We'll see the practical application of this in one second. And therefore we come back now. And we say that the Rishoyim are immediately written into the book of death. What does that mean? And the Tzadikim we said are really written into the book of the Rishoyim into the book of death, the Tzadikim into the book of life, and the Benonim, totally involved in they're hanging and standing. So what does it mean that the Tzadikim are written into the book of life? Thank you so much. Thank you. So what does it mean that the Tzadikim are written into the book of life? So we said before, 28 years ago, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zeker Tzadik Levracha, stepped out from this world on the day before Purim, on Titus Esther, one day shy of his birthday, of his, uh, of his bris day. In that same year, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, Zeicher Tzadok Levracha, also on the day of his bris day. They said, Rabbi when he became an elderly person, they asked him, Bama Arach the Yamim, why did you live to be so old? He said, because I tried my whole life never to hurt another person. And they said that he would have also passed away on the day of his bris. Moshe Rabbeinu lived 120 years from, because he was born, born Mahal. He was born with, with, without the requirement, without the need for a bris meal. He was born in that state of perfection. So he passed away on his birthday. But the real tzaddikim are passing away on the day of their bris, the day they became shalim, the day they became perfect. So he passed away on, 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 on the Tainus Esther because it would have been a shter. It would have been a, how do we say, a disturbance to the joy that people have on Purim had he passed away on Purim. He was called Moshe because the, uh, he, was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was actually he was born on Purim, which is on Zion Adar, which is the Yurtzeit, the birthday and the bris day of, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, so he passed on. So what happens is, when the shofar blows, so the tzaddikim, and maybe some people have some concept of a helium balloon, right? Remember the old, the old helium balloons, okay? I think they still have them around a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm remembering from, a, from an old show I saw a long time ago, right? 
Maybe it was, you know, we're off to see the wizard somewhere, somewhere over there, right? I remember this picture of the, of the helium balloon. So the tzaddikim, when the shofar blows, ah, they immediately inspired. They immediately want to go up. They immediately want to it, it, it express that ratzon, that, that deep desire that they have. And since they have already well-trained hands that are not bound and limited by chatoyim, and since their hearts and their minds have been trained and they're open to understand and to express new, beautiful levels of kedusha, of holiness, of, of, of avodas Hashem, so immediately their balloon begins to lift up and they begin to climb. I, what happens, the person ends up exiting the world. So Chaim doesn't mean only life in this world. We say, Atem Adveikim Be'ashem Elokeichem Chaim Kuchem Ayom. What does life mean? Life means to be attached to a Kodesh Baruch That's really life, to be attached to Hashem. And the Talmud says that Tzadikim Afilu B'misasan Nikru Chaim. That Tzadikim, even in the death, they're called life. So he begins a chart, a, he begins to chart a course, the Tzadik, that year, that maybe he goes beyond the limits of this world and he continues to climb on an infinite curve closer and closer, Kirves Elohim Litov, he becomes closer and closer to Hashem because the chauffeur inspired him to move in that direction. And he continues, even beyond this world, he goes into the next world. Atem advekim be'ashem elokechem, you who are cleaving to Hashem, chayim, you are really chayim, kol chayim, kulchem hayom. And the Rashaim, we said, what happened? Yamach Shemo, Hitler. He was living 1939, 1940, 1941, 1942. How did such a thing like that happen? And the answer I think we can understand, because when the chauffeur blows, the Rashaim don't even hear it. It doesn't, it doesn't penetrate their stubborn ears. It's too filled with, with, with bubble gum and rap music, and they don't hear it. They're loaded down in this world with bad habits and addictions and nasty emotions, brutish, angry, jealous, zealous for the wrong things. And that year, when the chauffeur blows, they're not inspired, and they don't lift up, and they don't make any step towards improvement, going vertically closer to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, Kirbis Elohim Litov. As a matter of fact, they become more and more stuck and mired in this world. And that's why I think of Himmler, Yamach Shemo, also one of Hitler's side people. He said in 1930s, the late 1930s, he was a mensch. In the early 40s, he was an ubermensch. He was a superman. And by the mid-1940s, he was Oismensch. He wasn't even a person. He went from being famous to being infamous. It's a big difference. Because when a person is famous, ooh, he made the front cover of this. But we live in an Olam Hafach Re'iti. We live in a world, in Ol- an Alma de Shikra, that somebody became famous, became famous, he became the poster child for wickedness, for the Sutton himself. People don't name casually their children Adolf anymore for some mystical reason. Because he became... He became the poster child for ugliness and wickedness and, 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 and decrepitness. And therefore, his balloon and, and, the, and, and the, the bottom part of the balloon, there's the spiritual part, the ruchnis, that, that, that wants to go up. And there's the other part that becomes more and more weighed down and becomes sunk deeper and deeper and deeper into the morass of this world. And that's not called life. And the Talmud says that Rashaim, wicked people, even in their lifetime, nikru. Uh, 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 mace, they're called dead. So he became more and more dead. So he wasn't written to the book of life those years, he was written to the book of death. All the power that he gained pushed him further and further underneath into the mud of this world. And he was lost till he's lost forever. And the Benonim, the in-betweeners, the use and me's the planet. So those people are lifted up because they hear the blow of the chauffeur, ah! and we become inspired. We want to do more. We want to crown a Kodesh Baruch Hu. We identify with, the, with, with all the good ideals that are, that are laced into the Musaf. And we hear the beautiful Baal and he lifts everybody up, and the whole congregation is in this balloon, and we want to go up. That's the beauty of Rosh Hashanah. Hamelech, we want to go up. But as we go up, the balloon is lifting up into the world of the ideal, the unlimited direction. And all of a sudden, as the balloon goes up, mm, suddenly it feels those heavy ropes that are pulling the 
basket and holding it in its place. You ain't going anywhere. Like the elephant. You're not going anywhere. You're staying here with me. Because there's these big stakes that are driven into the ground. And then there's, there's these heavy sand filled bags that are hanging off the edge of the basket that say you can't go anywhere. What are those ropes? They start out like little threads, but they were repeated chatoim that happened over and over again. You double the thread, and you double the thread, and you double the thread, and it suddenly becomes hard like a rope. Our sages tell us. And you take that little bag, some repeated action. It may not have seemed so bad, but it filled up a, a giant heavy bag, and now it's hanging there. Now what do we do? I want to go up. Ah! But I'm stuck. Ah! What do I do? Toilin the omdin. Ubenanim tolim the omdim ad yom kippur. They told him they're hanging because they want to go up. Omdim. They're stuck. Now there's two ways to break that tension. One is I can't take the pressure. I don't like feeling guilty. It's all about too, guilt. It's too much guilt. It's not arbitrary guilt. It's real guilt. It's real responsibility. But the person sometimes feels, you know something? I don't like this tension. I can't take the tension. Boom, boom, boom. Let's shoot a couple of holes into the balloon. Let's get cute and funny, make some good jokes with my friends. We'll go out to the club, we'll have a good time. And then all the energy and accomplishment of the Rosh Hashanah goes out. Ah, oh, I relaxed it. I relaxed all that pressure. But then I'm not going up. I'm going to get sunk deeper into this world. That's what happened. Well, the other way is that the person over the course of the next eight days after Rosh Hashanah says, I need to go up. I need to make a step in the right direction. So he takes out his little magnifying glass. When I was a kid, we used to go out in the backyard on a sunny day. We'd take a magnifying glass. And with just the light of the sun, if it would be focused onto a little point, we'd be able to burn ants, I mean, uh, leaves, right? <laughs> and, and we could focus it. And the person, I'm going to take the light of truth on some achievable point in my life, I'm not going to hang around with those people anymore. I'm not going to speak Lashon Hara anymore. I'm going to take on a discipline. I'm not going to eat you know, this questionable heksher. Or I'm not going to go to this place where the people are not dressed appropriately, the, the intermingling of the, I'm not going to look over here. I'm not going to hit that button, not that icon. I'm not going to go to YouTube. I'm not going to check my email all day. I'm going to pull myself back from it. I'm going to put a gvul. I'm going to put a discipline over here. And I'm going to regret having done it, go through all the steps of tshuva. And by that, the person puts a little hole into the sandbag and begins to bleed out some of the sand. Or he puts a, his eye onto one of those little ropes that's been holding him down, some practical rope, and it begins to shred until in Yom Kippur, boom, it breaks. And when it breaks, then the balloon goes up a half an inch. And mazel tov, the person's been written into the Book of Life. He's going up. Kir Vasilakim Litov. He didn't take one giant step forward, mother may I, but even an inch, he's pulling up in the right direction. That's what it's all about. That's what we want to accomplish on Rosh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Kodesh Baruch Hu wants us to stretch, our, uh, stretch ourselves out back to the ideal on Rosh Hashanah. And then he wants us to get uh, back to the ideal. He wants us to get real between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur until we make some change, some practical, even if it's a small change. If the person feels that real ideal that's in his heart, that real idealism, the original idealism of the whole world, and he can attach himself to it and take a, 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 a hitch with a rocket ship, take a hitch with the whole Jewish people, then Matova Manayim, that's the most unbelievable thing. And if he can do some practical thing to improve himself and to get himself closer to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, then that healthy tension between the is where we happen to be, and the ought, and where we ought to be, on those types of strings, you can play the music of life. You can, right? If you sit and you try to play music on, 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 on guitar strings, David Amelik's uh, harp, but the, but, the, but the strings are not, you know, they're all mushed together. You can't make music on that. Only when there's this tension between where we are and where we ought to be, on that we begin to play the music of life. I'm going to finish up with two brief stories. They're actually one-minute stories, but because... I'm so verbose, it takes me two minutes to tell them, so excuse me. <clears throat> and one of them is a story about, I heard from one of my Rebbe's many years ago, about a fisherman 
and he was bringing from the river, he was bringing his giant harvest of fish. He dragged his big net, and he pulled up you know, a big load of fish, and he dropped it onto the dock, and the fish are jumping all over the place. And he has a big sign, he's selling the fish, freshly harvested, freshly caught fish, fresh fish. Of course, in the marketplace, there's always a skeptical guy. Some guy looks, you know, it's not a diamond, it's a cubic zirconium, it's not this, how do you know, it's this, it's not the same, it's only in the outside. He says, it's killjoy. He says, how do you know that they're fresh fish? He says, maybe you caught dead fish too. And the, and the fisherman says, no, I have live fish here. I just caught fresh live fish. He says, how do you know? He says, you know something, when fish die, they float on the river and they go down. Maybe your net picked up the dead fish with the live fish. And how do you know you have fresh live fish over here? How can you guarantee such a thing? And the fisherman was unmoved. And he says, I promise you, I can guarantee that I have live fish. He says, how do you know you have live fish? He says, very simple. He says, I drag my net strategically downstream, facing downstream. The fish that I'm catching are going upstream. And if a fish is going upstream, then we know that he's alive. Right? The fish that die, they go, down, they go down the stream. The ones that are alive are going up the stream. We want to go upstream. It could be that's just why there's an old saying, you are what you eat. Right? It's, it's a Jewish concept. It could be. The, the, the Malbim says by the, why we don't eat the hind quarter of the animal if the Yaakov Avinu had a wrestling match because he was damaged over there, is because there's something about the hind quarter of the animal, the Malbim says, that inspires certain passions that we want to limit because even that part of the animal might waken certain passions that we, don't, we want to try to contain as much as we possibly can and, and use. So therefore, not only are we what we eat, but which part of what we eat. So there's such a concept like that. And that's why Jews, Tadikim, Jews are eating lox, right? Because there's a salmon is swimming habitually upstream. We want to go up. We want to go against the tide to get back to the source, to get back to where we belong. That's story number one. Another story is a sweet story about a little boy, Jewish boy, in the Bronx. His parents didn't give him a Jewish education. They were communists, whatever. And now came the day of his bar mitzvah. And he realized the clock ticked and he became 13. And he wants to celebrate his bar mitzvah. He feels he wants to do something, but there was no celebration. There was no kiddush. There was no laning. There was no reading of the Torah. He had nothing. He had no way to celebrate. But he felt he wanted to do something. So he went into the local candy shop, and he had his eye for weeks on a kite, a beautiful kite, the largest kite. And he says, I want that kite, that big one over there, he says to the shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper says, oh, that'll be 5 $6, $6. And the fellow reaches in his pocket, boy, and he puts $6 on the table. And then he says, I'd like the largest ball of string that you have. He goes, oh, that'll be a few more dollars. And the boy had saved up all his money from his paper route that he had, and he pulled, poured all the change onto the table. And he says, OK. He gave him a kite string. So with all his money, he got a beautiful kite and the largest ball of kite string. And he went out into the park, Van Cortland Park. And he was running along. It was a blustery, windy day with some beautiful clouds decorating the sky. And he was letting the kite string out. And it was going higher and higher and higher. It was going so high that it actually penetrated the clouds and disappeared. But the boy was running along near the edge of the park. And he was skipping. And he was singing. He saying, today, I'm a man. I'm a Jewish man. And it's my bar mitzvah. <laughs> I'm a bar mitzvah boy. It's my bar mitzvah. I'm so happy. It's my bar mitzvah. I'm a Jewish man. And as he gets near the edge of the park where the cars are running, a bus is there at a red light. And this fellow drops the window. I think it was the same fellow that was bothering the fisherman. <clears throat> he says, little boy, what are you doing? The boy says, I'm a Jewish man. Today's my bar mitzvah. And I'm flying a kite. I'm flying a kite. I'm a, I'm a Jewish man. And I'm flying my kite. And this man looks up into the sky, peeks his head out. He says, little boy, maybe you're just fooling yourself. Maybe it's just all imagination. He says, because I don't see no kite. And the boy, his heart skipped a beat. And he got sad for just one second. But then he recovered. And before the light turned green and the bus took off, he answered the man and he told him. He says, I can still feel the, the tension. I can still feel the taut in the string over here. And as long as I can feel the tension of the string, he says, then I know that the kite is still there. Right? 
there's a little part of us, there's a neshama, Yiddishkeit, right? Which is way up in the sky. Sometimes it seems like it's distant from us, it's far from us. But in Rosh Hashanah, we feel that tension. We awaken that tension, the tension between where we are. If we feel settled, if we feel okay, if we're having just a relaxed time, that's the joy that's going to happen on Rosh Hashanah, is that we begin to feel that tension. That's the music, that's the song that's going to be created. When we get inspired, we say we want to do more, but we have to do something very, very practical over here. Any little practical deed that we did, even small thing, Avram Avinu, he brought, he, he was willing to bring up his son, he was willing to give up his son, Yitzchak, which was everything. Yitzchak was everything. Nobody ever had an everything like Yitzchak had an er, er, like Avram had an everything in Yitzchak. It was his whole future. It was his whole past. It was his whole reputation. It was his son, Bincha, his, your son, Asher Ahavti, it's Yitzchak, his, his, his beautiful son. His whole future, all the promises that will come in the future were in Yitzchak. And, 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 and everything that he had raised in that beautiful son and all his reputation, he told people, Hashem doesn't want us human sacrifice, willing to give up everything. Ah, that was the ideal. And in the end, he ends up bringing what? A ram. <coughs> Big deal, the ram. So we go back and we blow the chauffeur. It says that he wanted to do everything, <coughs> but he ended up doing something. And that little something he did is considered as if he did everything. That's the accomplishment of Rosh Hashanah. That's the beauty of the chauffeur. We step up and we say, look, with the chauffeur, it, this chauffeur means that I want to do everything. But I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to do something for you, Kodesh Baruch Hu. I'm willing to take one step forward. Being willing to take one step forward is a guarantee, especially if we're willing to do, we would, in our hearts, would want to do everything, but this is what we can afford to do right now. This is the next step that we have to take, the next practical step. If Rosh Hashanah brings us to take that next step with Yom Kippur, then it's considered as if we did everything, and that's the beauty. That's how the shofar means, shofar means actually to beautify. We're being beautified by the shofar when we present it. We're saying, Kodesh Baruch Hu, remember what Yitzchak did. We're remembering what Yitzchak, what, what Abraham and Yitzchak did. They were willing to give everything. Ah! But they did something, whatever it was that was in their hand. Anything that you're able to do within your ability to do it, with your ability to do it, do it. Then that's, that's going to be our accomplishment, Consider as if we did everything. We were mamlech a Kodesh Baruch We crowned the Kodesh Baruch with our small, tiny steps. And with that, Bez Hashem, that's how we're going to be written. A ksiva, a chasim, a tova, a healthy and a happy new year, and a, a year of life, Bez Hashem, for all of us. Yeah.